right, hello, 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 welcome to Yesterlore number 8, if I'm not mistaken. I know I got the number wrong last week, so this might be 9, or I might have fixed it, and maybe last week was 7 and this is 8. Um, not super important. However, um, welcome to Yesterlore, I'm Grimm's Lawyer. And today, we are going to be looking at some runestones. Um, I alluded to this briefly last week. But today, we're going to look at some runestones. Don't get too intimidated by what's on the screen right now. <laughs> I'm going to explain it um, shortly. Uh, but first, I wanted to start with just some updates about the channel um, and all that stuff. So, as I said last time uh, I'm gonna be moving forward with continuing to do that's kind of redundant uh, yester lore uh, weekly for the time being uh, we might get to a point where I'm gonna do some more con lang with me and I might do some kind of one-off con lang stuff and other linguistic stuff but uh, the main series that's gonna continue weekly is yester lore and that's gonna be Friday evenings uh, 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that it, um, should be on my schedule. If you look at it on my uh, Twitch channel, you will see it in your time zone. So that is the plan moving forward, just continuing to do Yesterlore. Uh, this week, like I said, we're going to be looking at some runestones. We're going to look at two runestones today. And then Next week, and probably the few following weeks, we're going to look at rune poems. We're going to start with the Anglo-Saxon rune poem. And we're going to talk a little bit about the rune poetry. So that is the plan uh, right now. Um, before we jump in, I just need to check something real quick, but then we'll get started with today's Yester lore. Today's yester lore does sound kind of funny, doesn't it? Um, today lore. That would just be the news, I guess. <laughs> today lore. All right, so let's get started. Um, rune stones, what are they? Uh, rune stones are stones that we find all over Northern Europe uh, with runes on them, believe it or not. Um, runes being the alphabets that were used by uh, early Germanic speaking peoples in Northern Europe, uh, probably, de uh, probably developed from the Old Italic script, which in turn probably came from the Greek alphabet. Um, but they're, they're pretty unique compared to the Old Italic script, and what's extra interesting is that they come in a very different order. Um, we actually have an order, or a couple orders technically, for the earliest runes, which we call the Elder Futhark. Now, Futhark comes from the order that the runes show up in. And these rows of runes, just listed in order, show up on a bunch of different artifacts. Um, which is why we have an idea of what the order was. Uh, we also see at least the Anglo-Saxon rune poem list the runes in roughly this order, but adjusted for the Anglo-Saxon runes, of course. The earliest rune system here that you see at the top is called the Elder Futhark. Like I said, the Elder Futhark is used on a lot of different small artifacts like um, horns, combs, bracelets, etc. that we find throughout Northern Europe. And it was used on early rune stones. And the sort of window that we see Elder Futhark runes in is from about the 4th century to the 10th century of the common era. 
AD. And it developed into a few sort of daughter rune alphabets. Uh, one of them is the Old English system of runes, Anglo-Saxon runes, which we'll be seeing next week. Um, and the other main descendant is the younger Futhark um, that you see here. Usually it's called the younger Futhark with an A. Um, the way that they decided to transcribe this rune here is with an O. Um, I think that transcription, sorry, whoops, scrolled down by mistake there. Um, I think that transcription actually makes a lot of sense, um, given its range of sounds in Old Norse texts that we have written in uh, Younger Futhark. Uh, but usually it's called Younger Futhark, uh, with an A as well. Futhork, with an O and a C, is usually what we call the Old English runes. Now what we see in this sort of diagram here um, is how the Elder Futhark runes might have developed into the Younger Futhark runes. And what you'll notice about the Younger Futhark runes, first and foremost, is that there are fewer. <laughs> there are fewer Younger Futhark runes than there are Elder Futhark runes. Um, however, this is not because there were fewer sounds <laughs> in the language. Uh, there's actually a period of time where the use of both overlaps a bit. Uh, the younger Futhark runes start appearing in like the 8th century-ish and uh, were used until around the 12th century CE. So there's a good 200-ish um, years where there's some overlap and you might see some intermediary uh, phases between these two systems where like some look more like Elder Futhark, some look like Younger Futhark, and some look just completely different. Um, there were a lot of variations. These are just sort of idealized, um, and honestly, some of them look different than the ones I typically see on rune stones um, and other runic artifacts. Uh, so there's a lot of variation in how the letters appear. These are just some sort of common shapes that we get for them. Uh, but you can see that there's fewer. There are fewer younger Futhark runes. And this kind of makes it difficult, more difficult than it already is, to read uh, younger Futhark runes. Because um, if you look at what uh, these sounds represented, these sound value rows here, you can see that there's mostly, like, there's some questions that we have about some of these, but there's mostly a one-to-one -one between the rune and the sound that it could be in the Elder Futhark. Um, that doesn't mean they didn't have spelling variations and skip letters and things like that in Elder Futhark, because they definitely did. But in the Younger Futhark, we see that one rune could potentially be a lot of different sounds. So that is an added difficulty with reading the Younger Futhark runes. Um, so we can see, sort of, for example, there's the k sound and the g sound that are both represented in Elder Futhark with separate runes, and both of those sounds are represented with one rune in Younger Futhark. Um, same with T and D, B and P. Um, basically, voicing isn't contrasted <laughs> in the Younger Futhark. The other thing you might notice is a lot of these say N, T, N, M, B, N, K, N, G. Uh, a lot of the times, nasal sounds, like Ns or Ms, were not represented in the runes. They were just sort of the end of a syllable. You can kind of leave it off, save yourself some space, and imply it. We've kind of seen something similar to this in manuscripts that we've looked at so far. Uh, usually, though, they'll write some kind of line or some kind of mark over the vowel that comes before the nasal sound, the N or the M. Uh, runes do not give us that help there. We just kind of have to infer them when we see them. Uh, or when it would make sense in the word to have a nasal there. So that can be considerably difficult um, reading uh, Younger Futhark runes. However, both of the rune stones we're going to look at are written in Younger Futhark, so we're going to do the challenging ones. <laughs> um, not that Elder Futhark is not challenging. Um, it definitely is. Uh, but we're going to look at some Younger Futhark runes um, on some rune stones. Now, the rune stones that we find in especially Scandinavia, but all over the place in Northern Europe, 
uh, typically are memorials, um, sort of memorial monuments to someone or multiple people. And both of the runestones that we're going to look at today would fall into that category of memorial runestones. Um, these were often commissioned uh, by the person who wants the wanted the memorial. Um, not everyone had the ability to carve runes. Um, not only was literacy limited to specific people a lot of the time, but there were also there's also the issue of being a stonemason that the rune carvers needed to be able to carve into stone. That takes some skill. And so there were actually rune carvers that were contracted for specific memorials. And both of the rune stones that we see were contracted by women. Um, so that's something that's interesting that we're going to see in the runes today. Uh, the other interesting thing is that we kind of know the names of quite a few of these rune carvers, which is rare for um, ancient and medieval texts. We often don't have the author of a given text. Uh, a lot of things are anonymous, especially things like rune stones. Um, but in fact, especially in the Viking Age, uh, we either have the signatures of some rune carvers, or we can tell maybe from one stone that does have a signature and the style or the handwriting or the sort of art that goes with the runes on another that, oh, this must have been the same rune cover because they date to around the same time, have a similar style, similar handwriting, etc. Um, the first of the two rune stones we're going to look at, we don't have the carver of, at least we're not sure who the carver is. And the second rune stone that we're going to look at, we actually do have an idea of who, um, who carved it. Um, so before we get into the actual runestones themselves, um, I just wanted to remind the chat that if you have any questions as we're going along, uh, feel free to type them. I am happy to try to answer them if I know the answer or try to point in the direction of the answer if I do not know. Um, all right, without further ado, let's get into the first runestone. And I'm going to zoom in a bit in just a moment. Um, let's see here. Okay. Let me zoom in some more. Right, getting it to fit in this screen is a little awkward here, but, um, because it's pretty tall, <laughs> this rune stone. Uh, but what we see here is uh, what is labeled by runologists as VG150. Uh, usually the designation or naming for a particular runic artifact, especially runestones, is some kind of abbreviation of where it's located and then a number that it's given. Which runestone in that area is it? I'm going to fix the fireplace a little bit here. Um, so VG150 is located in uh, Vesteljotland in uh, Sweden. Sorry if I mispronounced that, I do not speak Swedish. Um, we're looking at uh, Old East Norse, which is the ancestor to Swedish, um, and I'll do my best with that, but my Swedish is pretty non-existent. <laughs> so apologies if I mispronounced that. But Vesteljotland is the home to a lot of rune stones, actually. Sweden is the country with the highest density of runes <laughs> per county, and um, uh, so that's why both of the runestones we're looking at today are from Sweden, because it just they have the most, uh, which is pretty cool. Now, the thing that makes this a little difficult for people who study runology and Old Norse is that most of the Old Norse texts that we have from uh, like books and such is Old West Norse from either Norway or uh, Iceland, primarily Iceland. So it's a bit different in terms of what vowels we see mostly in Old East Norse. Um, the old East Norse that these rune stones are uh, representing very imperfectly, as we can see from the the younger Futhark runes above, they're not going to be very uh, specific to what sounds they are. So that's already a challenge. And then there's the added challenge of it's a dialect of Old Norse that is not exactly the dialect that most Old Norse scholars end up studying and reading the most. Um, 
Now, this rune stone is dated to sometime around um, the early 11th century. So think early 1000s, um, sort of height of the Viking Age during this time. And uh, as you can see, maybe, I know it's hard to see because I can't zoom in very far given the shape uh, without cutting it off. You know, what, I'm going to try to zoom in even more. Um, anyway, uh, no, I don't want to make it fatter. I did anyway. Okay. Um, how this rune stone goes is we actually have, uh, it starts here and then it goes up the rune stone and then it, there's a word up here and then it curves and then you read it down this way. So the sort of top of the letters are here and the bottom is here. Um, so it's like an arch of stone. So that's how we're going to have to read it. And um, this picture does not have super good quality in terms of like being able to make out the runes because of the angle that we're from. So what I did is I sort of clipped them. <laughs> I cropped uh, the parts of the stone that had text. And I uh, like, you know, played with the sort of features of the image. I increased the contrast and things like that. Um, some of these are going to look different from each other just because um, I didn't do it all in one go. It was sort of split into separate images, so they're going to look a little bit different, but hopefully they're still uh, legible. Uh, what I did is I took the rows, so this is the first row that goes from bottom to top. Um, I sort of increased the sort of contrast and things like that, and I uh, used a pen tool on a photo editor to uh, make these a little bit bolder. I sort of drew what rune it is a little bit more clearly so we can see them a bit. Um, so this is the row going up. This is the single word that's at the top. As you can see, it's going at a weird angle, so it's arching a bit here. And then this is the row that goes down over here. Now, even with that, it is kind of hard to make out the runes, so I also have them typed out in Unicode down here. Thankfully, um, the older Futhark, or yeah, the elder Futhark, at least m the most standard forms of them that we see, because like I said, there's a lot of variation in the shapes of these runes. Um, the standard ones of the elder Futhark, the younger Futhark, actually there's a few variants of the younger Futhark that there are um, characters for, and the um, old English Futhark are in Unicode, thankfully. Um, so it is possible to write in runes. And so that's what I have here. Uh, we have uh, the sort of text. And what you'll notice is there aren't spaces. <laughs> and this is pretty common for a lot of ancient languages. We looked at some, um, if you remember the hieroglyphs that we looked at, of course, there were no spaces in the hieroglyphs. <laughs> and um, the ancient Greek uh, that we looked at was documented during the Byzantine period. So they were starting to use spaces at that point. But ancient, ancient Greek, uh, w which was in all capitals as well, uh, did not use spaces very often, nor did Latin. Um, however, uh, runes are typically a little bit more helpful. Uh, we don't have spaces, but what you'll see are these sort of colons. Um, sometimes it's just a single dot in the middle. Sometimes it's a colon. And these colons are actually showing word breaks, which is useful. Um, uh, you also see these X's sometimes. Now, the difference between the X and the colon is not super clear. It's not super consistent. Sometimes the X's are showing like, okay, this is a new sentence, but sometimes it's just separating words. That's not super reliable. But at least we know where one word ends and the other begins for the most part, which is super helpful. Uh, so uh, if you look at the romanization that we have here that I did, I basically took the runes and put them into their sort of most simplified representation that we see here. Um, I'm mostly, it's mostly sort of mapping onto the first row of sound values, although there's some ex uh, exceptions like this, I just do O, the simplest. Um, yeah, I'm mostly following these um, transliterations here uh, for the Elder Futhark runes here. Um, and so what we're going to be able to do is where we see these colons and X's, we can put spaces. And then what we have to do is try to figure out what what actual word in actual Old East Norse is it probably. <laughs> so that's the challenge. So I'm going to go up and make this a bit smaller. 
um, so that I have more space on the page to do the transliteration because I'd like to keep it on the first page if I can. Um, because I kind of want this. Um, am I in print view? Because I kind of want to be if I can. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so the formula that these runestones tend to be in is they tend to start um, at least um, in this period, although there's always some variation. Um, usually they start with who commissioned the runestone. And so we're going to put this into more of like a name. And the thing to be aware of with the vowels is that they're not going to map very closely to sort of the standard transcription from uh, sort of pen written documents that we see from this time period. For example, the value O that we're used to is usually going to be U, as is the value Y here. These three over here are pretty, like, a good deal later um, in terms of the dating, uh, whereas these these are sort of the most standard ones. These 16, I think that's 16, um, should be 16, <laughs> younger Futhark words, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so if we have like a U, it could be a U or a Y or an O. <laughs> um, it could also be what we tend to write with a V in the Roman alphabet. It's like a W sound in Old Norse. And the letter I can just as easily be an A or a diphthong I in Old East Norse. Um, but an A can also be I. And sometimes we see AI being I as well. It, there's a lot of variation in the spelling of the same word. And, but we're kind of used to that in Easter lore at this point. Uh, so it might be a bit difficult, difficult to figure out. But the, the benefit that I have <laughs> is that I actually know a name that this reminds me of. And that is the name. Uh, there are a few variants. Sometimes we see it as uh, Thorvi, and sometimes it's Thirvi. Uh, in Old English, we pronounce more like th uh, Thurwi or Thorwi. Um, basically, it means uh, literally something like Thor's uh, Thor's temple or Thor's sacred space or something like that. A V, uh, sorry, a we in Old Norse, or a we in more standard Old West Norse, what we call a ve a lot of the time in modern English, is supposed to be a temple uh, or a sanctuary of some kind. So, um, and this was a uh, woman's name, uh, Thirui. Thirui. In Old West Norse, this would probably be, uh, well, Thirui. Thirui. Um, so that's probably the name of the person who commissioned this. Then we have this word here that looks like risti. risti. Now, usually the second thing we're going to have in the, sort of the formula that we see in a lot of runestones is a verb. <laughs> and it's usually this verb or some variation of it and this noun that comes after it. Um, here it's in the past tense. It's um, in Old East Norse, so it would probably be something like risti. Uh, sorry, rice, the, uh, this diphthong here, I, in Old Westerners so it would have been a, uh, Aisti, but it's Aisti here. Uh, now the reason it's a thorn here is probably because um, this T here is actually dissimilating a bit from the S. Uh, dissimilation is when a sound becomes more different from a sound that comes before it, or after it, depending on what order you're going in. Uh, here, in uh, Proto-Germanic, the suffix here would have been something like the for the past tense here. This is a past tense ending. This is the same origin as our ed, um, but we do have some verbs uh, that kind of where the ed is sort of more like a t sound, and we even spell it like with a t in words like kept. Um, so. In more standard uh, Old Norse, we spell this with a T, and it would have been uh, raisti. But we can see in the runes that this is sort of a more transitional stage where it's still like a Z sound, so risti, raisti, raisti. Um, and that is actually the past 
participle of, I believe, Raisa, or Raisa in Old Easterners, and it means to raise something up, and it's actually related to the word raised. So this is raised. So Sirui, raised, and then our next word is probably a uh, stein. It's stain in Old West Norse. Uh, stein is stone, and that's related to the English word stone. So, uh, we raised a stone, probably this stone. <laughs> so, we raised this stone. And then we have iftir. That's probably uh, Old East Norse, uh, aftir. Um, why is this R capital? like a small capital, it's because it's actually a different letter than normal R. We see this R, this R rune, looks a lot like the Roman capital R. Uh, this is different. This actually comes from the Proto-Germanic one that's actually flipped upside down, <laughs> this one here. They're transliterating it as a capital R here because in old, um, in like Proto-Norse, which is what Elder Futhark runes are usually representing, uh, that's how we tend to uh, transliterate it. In later Old Norse, we just write it with an R, because it probably, uh, well, it eventually did become an R in Icelandic, for example, and Faroese. But uh, it comes from the, uh, the Proto-Germanic letter Z, actually, the Z sound, and it went from like a Z to more of a, like a Z. It's like a Z that's further back and a bit lower, like you're not closing uh, your tongue as close to the top of your mouth as you would with the normal letter Z. It's more like a z, z, and that kind of went to, on to become a z, like a trill here. Um, so at this stage, it's probably still um, pronounced a little bit differently because it's being written differently here. So uh, eftir, this is related to the word after in English, but it doesn't mean quite the same thing. Uh, eftir here is sort of after in the sense of on behalf of or following on from someone or something. And when we're talking about a memorial, this is sort of a way of indicating it's um, commemorating. So should we raised this stone commemorating or on behalf of after. And then we have ukmut here, ukmut. And I think this is probably going to be uh, our first instance where we don't have a nasal written. But there probably is one here. Uh, because there is an Old Norse name. Uh, Ogmund. Uh, whoops. Ogmund is actually the nominative Ogmund here because it's not the subject. It's the um, object of this preposition after. Um, after Ogmund. Ogmund, um, I think later it's usually written more like Ogmund. But... I might be mistaken. Um, but it means, I think it comes from uh, Augi, Augi, which means sharp. And um, uh, Munt, which means uh, sort of protection, comes from the root for hand. Um, oh, someone in the chat. Uh, he has all the special symbols on his keyboard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually use win compose for special characters like this, and this, and this. Um, the runes, I actually had to use the LexiLogos rune typer tool because um, I don't have a, an easy way to type them on my computer. Um, so yeah, so far we have Thirvi uh, raised the stone after Ogmundur, um, is who she raised it for. Ogmundur. Uh, the next word here is and I think, again, we have a nasal thing missing here. So we have an, a U here, but it's probably a U-N. Because at the ends of syllables, often we don't have ends written out. Um, I think the same thing is happening here. Um, I think this is the word uh, bon, uh, bonda, bonda. And bonda means, uh, it actually means two things. It, me it can mean farmer. It actually comes from the verb bua, which means to to like inhabit the land. <laughs> uh, so bond, uh, bondi is someone who is a farmer. But it can also mean husband. Or like, there's the word husbondi, which is where the word husband comes from, uh, which means like the master of the house, the house 
farmer, <laughs> literally. Uh, so bondi, and this is just a different case. It's because it's coming after this preposition. Uh, so it's probably husband, and then this next word sin. This is probably sin. Uh, uh, referring back to her. It's a reflexive pronoun. So, her husband. So, Ogmundr was probably her husband. And so, Thirwi raised this stone on behalf of Ogmundr, her husband. All right, and then we have this next word, mjok. And I think this is pretty straightforwardly the word uh, mjok, uh, which means great. Uh, great. Uh, or like very, I think probably here, because then we have... Uh, Kuthan, and I think this is the word uh, Gulan, good. <laughs> so it's like very good, greatly good. And then Thikn, I think, is uh, Thikn. Thikn is Thane, or sort of like warrior who's loyal to a lord, is what Thane uh, usually literally means. But it can also just become a generic word for man. Very good man, very good Thane, a very good warrior. So should we raise this stone on behalf of or for her uh, for Ogmund her husband, um, a very good man or a very good thane. And then we have this next uh, I think what's a its own phrase because we actually see this pair of words on a bunch of rune stones from this period. It's probably the name Thor, uh, the god Thor. Um, God of uh, Storms, God of Thunder, uh, that Thor. <laughs> and then it's probably, after that, the verb vigi. Uh, vigi means, uh, it's the subjunctive, so it's like a wish. It's like may he uh, vigia, and vigia means to consecrate or to hallow. Uh, someone in the chat says, it's crazy how close to English it is relative to the other languages you've covered. Yeah, now that we're back in Germanic languages instead of ancient Greek or ancient Egyptian, yeah, we can see how close it is. Yeah, third we raised a stone after, or like in commemoration of, uh, Ogmundur, her husband. Uh, very good thing. May Thor bless, or may Thor hallow. Um, and there's probably an implied these runes, this memorial, because this is, after all, a memorial stone. Most of the rune stones uh, that we have are memorial stones. So this is a wife who commissioned a stone to be raised and carved for her husband, um, probably who passed away or something like that. Um, and she's saying may Thor consecrate this memorial, or maybe may Thor consecrate him, his grave, wherever it happens to be. Um, so that is the first of the two rune stones. So we're going to go ahead and go to the second one. Now the second one is actually a rune stone that we've lost. We don't actually have it. There's a tiny fragment of it left that I think is sitting in a garden somewhere in Sweden. Um, but it was kind of destroyed in the process of, uh, I think it was a church that was built. Um, there's another rune stone that goes with it that we do have pieces of, but it's kind of like sticking out of the wall of the church. I should have uh, included a picture of that. But Thankfully, someone actually drew a picture of it before it was destroyed. So we actually know what it looked like. However, the person who drew the picture might have made some mistakes when they were copying it. Um, because this, I think the picture was drawn in like the 1600s, something like that. Um, what it is, it's, it's a rune label is uh, U141. Uh, oh, I have a question. Uh, that stone was written from top to bottom if someone was going to read it. Did they just know how to read from top to bottom, or would they just tilt their head? They would tilt their head, because the way that it goes is it starts... Uh, let me zoom in again. Uh, the text starts down here, and it's sort of like you have to tilt your head uh, to the left and read up, and then there's one word at the top, and then you have to tilt your head down to the right and read the rest, and that's what I kind of did here. I clipped them. This is from bottom to top. This is at the top. And this is from top to bottom. Um, now the thing is, we're not sure if the majority of people could read these. Maybe they could. It's possible. We don't know. Um, but we do know that a small number of people could write them just because you had to kind of be at least a... Sorry, my dog is scratching the floor. Um, stop. Um, 
you had to be at least a somewhat skilled stonemason to be able to carve like this into a stone. So people would commission these. We just don't know if most people could read them. Um, but uh, possibly, given that these are supposed to be memorials, you kind of hope that if you leave a memorial, people will be able to read it and remember the person you're trying to commemorate with the memorial. Um, so we don't know. Some people hypothesize that... Uh, Oh, it turned? Yeah, so it goes like this and then down like that. Um, some people hypothesize that actually maybe the majority of people could read. Um, I've seen an article that suggested that, uh, that the majority of people could actually read runes, um, or at least a good number of people. If, if people were commissioning stones to be written, um, and it seems like they were just kind of at least somewhat lay people i mean probably they were a little bit they had a little bit more resources as they can commission something like this in a mostly agrarian society uh this is sort of pre-feudalism uh so you don't exactly have like a super wealthy class but you have people who are able to commission um runestones so some people have suggested that maybe the majority of people could read them they just couldn't write them uh but we just aren't sure we don't know uh, so I don't know what they expected people to be able to do to read, but we're actually going to see that this next one is even kind of worse in that regard. Uh, I've actually tilted the, the drawing <laughs> of the runes uh, 90 degrees uh, clockwise because the drawing, I, I've cropped out sort of like the English text and the date of this, uh, but as we can see, the stone actually goes up this way. <laughs> and uh, I've tilted it because the text actually starts here on the head of the snake. Uh, now the the label for this one is U141. U stands for Upland. Upland, Sweden is where this is located. It's kind of just north of Stockholm. I think the church that ended up being where these runestones were is in, I think it's in a place that's tactically considered part of the Stockholm urban or metropolitan area. Um, but it's in Upland, at least originally it was in Upland. Um, and we actually have a good idea of who carved these. We have the, we have the name of, I guess, the author, the, the rune master, or rune carver is what they, we usually call them. Uh, and his name was Fotr. Uh, he drew a bunch of runes in sort of the mid-11th century, so I think 10, the middle of the 1000s. Uh, and he's kind of known for this style. He has like a signature style of like, sort of an Ouroboros-ish snake, you know, biting itself, or just this kind of similar snake dragon type motif. And then this sort of ray cross looking thing. That's another thing that like he tends to leave on his runestones. Um, we have his name because he signatured at least a couple of them. He did not signature this one, but from the style, we can probably guess he, he did this. It was from around the time that he was um, doing things, being commissioned to write runestones. So it was probably him. Um, just because of the style. It's pretty much his his style. Now, since this one just goes in a circle <laughs> like this, um, I went ahead and just typed it out. Now, this one, because someone drew it, it's a lot more legible than the last one from the image. Uh, but like I said earlier, since someone copied this down in the 1600s, um, I think there are some mistakes in copying it down. Like, they kind of misinterpreted some of the runes and because they're just drawing this probably freehand, uh, I mean, I don't know how else they could have been drawing this if not freehand, uh, they might have thought, oh, this must be this rune, and kind of tweaked it, you know, the angle a little bit to make it look like a different rune than it probably was. Or maybe Fulter made a mistake, made a typo, uh, especially given that there's no spelling rules at this time, it's not exactly a mistake. But in any case, we're going to look at what these runes say. I'm going to zoom out a bit. Uh, and scroll over so we can see. Um, now this one's kind of nice because for the most part, uh, Fulter actually likes to write the nasal vowels that usually, uh, like we saw in the last one, were skipped. Uh, Fulter likes to write them a lot, which is really handy for us. We don't have to imply them or infer them. I mean, as much. Pretty cool. So uh, let's go ahead and start. Uh, 
the formula for this one is pretty similar. You can already kind of see these words here uh, and guess what they mean uh, compared to the last one. Uh, so the formula usually starts with who commissioned it. And this is a pretty common name here. I'm pretty sure that this is the name uh, Guthlaug. Guthlaug. And Guthlaug, it, um, the first element, Guth, is actually the word God in Old Norse. And the second element, there's uh, some debate about this, but this element appears in a lot of women's names. Um, literally, Laug means bath or well, like a spring source of water that you'd wash things in. Um, so, But why it shows up at the end of a lot of women's names, we're not sure. Some people think that this is a reference to maybe like ritual cleansing of some kind, and um, therefore it's sort of an indirect way of saying like holy or something like that at the end of these people's names. Uh, we see Gudlog is a really common name, God bath or God well. Uh, another one is Oslog, and Os is another word for God, uh, usually referring to like the Isid, the, the uh, heathen gods. Uh, Guð can be used for heathen gods. It's also uh, what's, what was typically used for the Christian god as well. So tends to be in names that refer to gods. So maybe some kind of ritual washing is referred to with this name. But it, in any case, uh, we have a bunch of different Guðlogs in the records. And the second word here is probably the verb leit. Oh, this should be leit. And leit, um, it is related to the word let in English, actually. Um, kind of like you were saying, it's pretty close to modern English um, in some ways. Uh, uh, the verb leta, though, in Old Norse can mean a lot more things. It's sort of like it can mean allow, like let does in English, to allow, to let. Um, but also to sort of command or make happen to inc incite the happening of something. And probably here we could translate it as commission uh, because the next word is raisa again, like we had on the last stone. Uh, to, here it's um, to raise. Last time we had raised. Kind of, it almost sounded like Thirui was raising it herself, even though we're pretty sure she wasn't. Um, who knows, she might have. Maybe she was the author, but usually these were commissioned by people. So, um, Guthlau commissioned to raise, or had it raised. And then we have Stein. Um, we kind of expect Steina here. <laughs> I might, maybe Stein is fine here. We had Araisti Stein here. Um, but, uh, This next word, I think this is a place where we might have a mistake on the part of the person who drew this. So where we are here in the image is this spot here. And you see it looks like a vertical line with a uh, sort of diagonal positive slope line coming off from the top, center to the, to the top here. Um, but that does, this, there's no word that this makes sense to be coming before the following word. So probably what this is supposed to be, if we look in the runes here, this is probably actually supposed to be an A here and not a K. You can kind of see how both have like a sort of positive slope line, but it's just that one has something going through it and the other just starts in the middle. Uh, and that might have been a scribal error on the part of the person who drew this um, picture of the rune stone. Um, and I'm going to proceed with that assumption because I cannot think of a single word. This could be <laughs> kat here. Um, so I'm going to say that it's actually steina at, in which case uh, there's probably not a space here, but after it. And then it's steina at. <laughs> steina at. Um, and at makes sense here. At is a preposition, and this could also be like for. And then we have uh, hulmi, or sorry, hulma, right? Let me see. Oh, it says hulmi in the picture, but I think this is a place where I also assumed that they made a mistake and I preemptively put it there. I think this should be hulma grammatically. Uh, hulmi uh, is probably the name holmi. Holmi is. Um, the name of the person this is for. Kind of like we saw 
Thirui raised the stone for Ogmundr, her husband. We see Guthlaug had raised the stone for Holmi. Um, uh, Holm means like an uh, Holmur in Old Norse means like an, a small island. Uh, and so Holmi is probably the name that's derived from that. However, because we have at here, we grammatically want this actually to be Holma. And you can probably see how, if we look at what an I looks like in uh, the runes, here's an I, here's an A. Maybe the, the, the bar through the I was kind of faint, and the person who drew this didn't see it, because they just wrote an I here, or what looks like an I. So it's possible, um, because grammatically we probably ex expect an A here, Holma, Holma. Um, and then the next word is S-U-N, and that's probably son. In standard Old West Norse, it's usually written with an L, son. And that means what it looks like. It means sun. <laughs> and we see sin again. So uh, referring back to the subject here is Guthlaug. So her son. So Guthlaug had this stone raised for Holm Holmi, her son. And then we see the word han. And han is the pronoun he. So we're switching subjects here. So it's probably a new sentence. Uh, han. And then we see... T, and then this thing that I transcribed with the letter O here. Uh, this is probably a long O, uh, and this is probably a D. I don't think toll makes sense, but do does. Uh, do is the past tense of the verb uh, deia, deia, which means to die. And so do is died. He died. And then this is probably the preposition uh, all, uh, which can like at or in or on. Uh, it's probably in or on, but because the next word looks like it's in the dative case with an I here. And thankfully, Fulter wrote the ends for us here, which makes it a lot easier. Though for this word in particular, wouldn't be too hard without the ends to figure out. Um, the word here is... Um, why am I not typing it? I, I think I clicked on the wrong uh, window. Okay, all... Uh, this is probably uh, lang barda landi, and uh, they spaced it out because it's a compound word. But uh, usually, when we write normalized Old Norse, we put it all. It's one word. Lang barda landi means Lombard land. The Lombards were a Germanic tribe, probably a um, Old High German speaking, or uh, not quite Old High German, but. Uh, West Germanic speaking group whose language is pretty close to Old High German. Um, and they uh, primarily had uh, kingdoms in Italy, the Lombards, in like the 6th, 7th century. I think I might be off a little bit, but around that time. Um, there is still a region called Lombardy in Italy, uh, but it's a lot smaller than. They pretty much had most of the Italian peninsula at this uh, point. And because of that history, because these are the Germanic people who lived in Italy, uh, Langbardaland is a common Old Norse word for Italy. It just means Italy a lot of the time. It's just vaguely Lombard land. Uh, and Lombard, we can see how it's made up Langbarda. Uh, okay. Uh, Lang, long, uh, bard. Uh, Barda here is beard and land. land. So uh, long beards, uh, long bard, Lombards. So he died in Italy, is what this says. Uh, so actually, I should probably go back and write the translation for this one. So uh, why not keep it a thorn? I said, why not keep it a thorn? There we go. Uh, Thirvi raised this stone. For Ogmunder, her husband, a very good Thane, May Thor. Well, why? Why can't I spell Thor? <laughs> Thor, uh, hallow, um, bless, whatever. Okay, and this one, 
says Guslaug had the stone, maybe this stone, the stone raised for Holmi, her son. He died in Italy. Okay, so what we see here are probably the most common thing that rune stones are for. They're usually memorials for people who've passed away. And I thought these two were particularly interesting, A, because of the sort of way that they have to be read. This one's sort of in a uh, circle. <laughs> and the other one is um, sort of in an arch. Um, and I also thought they were interesting because they both were commissioned by women. So we can see um, an example of sort of women uh, making transactions <laughs> in old Norse society. Um, they did business. That was kind of a, a typical thing uh, that we'd expect, especially if a significant family member passed away, like a husband or a son in these cases. Um, it's kind of interesting also that we that they knew that, uh, in Guthlog's case, that her son died in Italy. Um, he might have been Viking, uh, Viking the verb, and that might have been what happened. Uh, and then she got news of it somehow. Uh, so both Swedish runestones, um, uh, it's actually been a long time since I've read directly from runestones, so this is really fun. Um, I wanted to ask if there's any other questions about the runestones or runes in general. Uh, while you're thinking, if you have any questions, um, next week we're going to start reading the rune poems. We're going to read the Old English rune, uh, rune poem first uh, and talk about what uh, what they might have meant, <laughs> the rune poems. Uh, we'll start with Old English and then we'll do, uh, I think, Scandinavian, uh, the Norwegian, and then the Icelandic one. I think that's the order I plan to do it. I might change the order. Um, but that's the plan. Uh, so, if there aren't any questions about these rune stones or runes or anything like that, um, it is uh, about a minute before I planned to end the stream. But I might just close down the stream if there are no other questions. Thank you, everyone who came. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of your time zone. <laughs> and I hope to see you next week when we start reading the Old English rune poem. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>